Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everybody. William Griswold is professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of California, sunny San Diego. <laughs> Always a pleasure to go down there, although today we shouldn't complain. And in any case, Bill knows about the weather here because he did and received his PhD in computer science at the University here of UW, University of Washington. Uh, he's the chair of ACM 6Soft and uh, also the program co-chair for the ACM IEEE International Conference on Software Engineering in 2005. And uh, research interests include ubiquitous computing, and you'll see more today about it, educational technology, software design for evolution, and aspect-oriented software development. And then instead of mentioning all the projects, I just let Bill talk about them. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Evelyn. So what I want to talk to you today is uh, about today is what I call the, the context-aware uh, conundrum. So we, we have a tremendous opportunities here uh, uh, in, in ubiquitous and context-aware computing and some real needs you know, we see in disaster response and elder care and things like that. But for me, it feels like the progress has been really slow. And it's almost like the technology isn't keeping up with how fast our lives are changing. So I feel that you know, many of us are increasingly nomadic and yet increasingly unaware of the activities going on around us, We're sort of uh, you know, rushing around with no time to really appreciate uh, the real opportunities that are there wherever we are. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, you know, the some of the projects I work on, for example, in disaster response, if you've ever seen one of these drills, it, it, uh, it takes hours to treat the first patient in a disaster uh, scenario because there's so much time spent on gaining control over people's, uh, the responder's safety, as well as managing information. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're familiar with the area of ubiquitous computing, you, you know that the classic application is finding a printer. Uh, that, and I still can't find one, at least one that works. So, uh, uh, but the good news is, is that you know, we really are connected today and we're working with a reasonable sensor platform. Uh, almost everybody uh, in, in uh, Europe and the United States today carries a mobile phone and those phones today are programmable and that's really exciting and it's actually got a lot of interesting sensors on it. Uh, and as most of you probably feel, mobile phones and, and related commodity technologies are going to have to be part of the ubiquitous computing uh, future that we envision. However, what I'm going to talk about is the significant barriers that are presented to us by using such technologies and how uh, object technologies and, uh, and, and related technologies will play a critical, critical role. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So m my uh, experience with these issues began with the Active Campus Project back in 2002. And uh, this project was undertaken uh, initially with the help of HP and later uh, by Microsoft. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we, the, the goal of this project was to uh, explore mobile context awareness in the campus setting to try to understand questions like, what would the applications be in such a, a, a socially and intellectually rich setting? What would the user interfaces be like? Um, uh, what effects would these applications have when you finally got them out in the field? What we build was built was location-aware, context-aware, and uh, privacy-aware. Uh, and some of the issues we had to deal with were things like service extensibility, that we wanted to add things to it all the time. But we had very limited screen real estate, limited memory, limited processor, et cetera. And we were also concerned with easing system management, that uh, uh, things change over time and having to constantly babysit. The world that you're sort of tracking is changing all the time, and that's, uh, that makes management hard. And of course, support for anonymity, a significant part of uh, being privacy aware. As part of that project, we deployed uh, 500 Wi-Fi PDAs, uh, uh, not the ones shown here, actually. Uh, they actually were HP Jornadas, very nice, very nice machines. Uh, and uh, 
we found a, 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 we had a number of interesting results. So first, one of the things we found is when we deployed this application here, which is called Active Class, and what you see here are a list of questions that uh, people have uh, typed in on their PDAs during class. And then people have um, voted on them here. So you see there's 35 votes for this question and 15 for that. And it's sorted in the order of the votes. Okay? And then people can enter answers in as well. And so this is sort of a, was a back channel of questions. So the instructor might take a break every 20 minutes or so to take questions. But a student can ask a question any time and start a back channel of discussion going on uh, rather than having, say, the students doing IMing each other you know, about the you know, instructor's close that morning or something like that. Okay? So you know, it's sort of we're trying to incentivize students to use technology for good rather than evil, if you will. And what we found with this is that we were, we were, well, we were hoping, it's like, oh, this is going to be great. You know, we'll, we'll be dealing with you know, issues of diversity in the classroom, you know, shy women and things like that. And it was difficult to see uh, changes to that effect. But what we found was that, that, the, that the topics raised were more diverse, that we broadened discourse, that students were willing to ask a wider range of questions, both really interesting, far-reaching questions raised by the material as well as low-level ones like changing the date for uh, uh, a project or something, a due date for a project. So this was very exciting to us because, of course, all, the university is all about ideas. And so this was an exciting thing. We basically found that this sort of modality narrows the discussion in ways that weren't necessarily uh, so positive. We also found there were creative uses of location. So one time I went off to lunch uh, uh, with a buddy of mine. And uh, my, my favorite student dropped by my office and I wasn't there. So he dialed up Active Campus, found out where I was, and came and joined us for lunch. And that was a really exciting. He was thinking about going to graduate school at the time, and we had a great conversation about uh, you know, applying to grad schools and things like that. Uh, we also found that, interestingly, people uh, tend to die IM each other when they were closer than average. So this was uh, instant message each other when they're closer than average. And this was an interesting result. So let me actually show you what's going on over here. This is our. Uh, a couple of screenshots of our Active Campus Explorer application. We see here are a couple of nearby buddies, Ingolf and Tim, and their locations. Uh, and uh, here are people who are a little bit farther away. And some me there's some messages waiting for me, and it's telling me where I am and things like that. Uh, and here's a map view uh, of, of you know, around where I am, and I can click through and bring up web pages. So basically, this is kind of, you know, geocoded web, right? And uh, so it could have been that displays like this encouraged people to IM each other when they were closer than average, basically to solidify you know, uh, you know, what it means to be you know, proximate to someone else. Uh, but to, to us, what this meant is that there's a real promise that you know, location-based computing uh, could matter in that, um, uh, in that, uh, because it changes the way people behave. And the people behave differently when they're proximate and, and far away from each other. And IM is not just an at a distance technology, or not necessarily. Uh, we also found that people were, uh, the students who used this system uh, were very willing to be seen. Almost all of them left the default settings of being able to be visible to their buddies and whatnot. And many more actually made themselves uh, visible to everyone on campus who, who used the system. So that meant that, that uh, privacy concerns were going to keep uh, social mobile applications like this from ever being adopted. Well, so basically, I can see that my buddies are on and where they are. So, you know, visibility of one's current location is sort of a key, key, you know, we're going to worry about. That's essentially the extent of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are other s small things, but these are the primary things. Is that you know, stalking is you know the, you know, well, if people know where you are, then you know, and this really didn't seem to concern people very much, uh, and it would even let people they didn't know see where they were at the time. Of course, you could always turn off the application if it was really important, right? And uh, if it was the privacy was really important at that moment. Lastly, we found, and this is what I, I'd sort of call a negative result for Active Campus uh, Explorer, was that we needed everywhere, all the time connectivity, not anywhere, anytime. It's like, oh, I can turn it on and have it when I want it. It has to be on all the time. What we found is that if you turned on your PDA and your buddies weren't on, you turn it back off again, of course. <laughs> Because you only have two to four hours of battery life, right? Uh, and there were also problems, uh, you know, with uh, the islands of 802.11b connectivity and things like that, where you'd, there'd be places you would be and you couldn't get uh, connectivity. And the, the UCSD has dramatic coverage, but it just wasn't 
you know, still there were many places that students would go where they couldn't get the coverage that they wanted. Uh, another thing was is that when we originally developed our IM uh, functionalities, that it didn't bridge over to the popular IMs. So students were sort of saying, well, I, I'm using AIM because that's what all my, uh, my buddies from high school are on. Uh, and there's really not room for two applications on this display. So it was really important that these ubiquitous computing technologies integrate with the prevailing technologies of the day uh, in order to uh, really succeed. So that's where we started. And then out from there, you know, looking at these social implications of ubiquitous and context-aware computing, we uh, uh, addressed a whole bunch of issues in software architecture on the client side and the server side. Really interesting issues in how do you build these systems. Uh, we also uh, um, have continued on in doing work in educational technology, working today on a system we call Ubiquitous Presenter. This is collaborative work with uh, Beth Simon and supported um, uh, by Microsoft, actually. It's a tablet PC uh, system. Uh, we've also had a significant effort in uh, disaster response, basically trying to Im use information technology to speed up and improve uh, uh, the care of people in disaster scenarios. I, I cited how slow they were. Um, uh, and lastly, uh, and more recently, to a significant extent, we've been working on mobile phones as a ubiquitous computing platform. Uh, in particular, uh, two applications, one called Placets and People Tones that I'll tell you a little bit about later. So that's the backdrop for this conundrum. And so now I'll just lay out my claim right here uh, at this point. What I want to say is that, claim is that context-aware computing is governed by three laws of context-aware computing. The ubiquity law, the commoditization law, and the systems law. And I'll, I'll tell you what those are in a moment. And out of these laws uh, arise uh, uh, very uh, complex issues, complex phenomena. Uh, to the point where, where I, I, I've noted and I claim that f failure, as we normally perceive it as systems builders, becomes a normal mode of operation to the point that you can't treat it like failure anymore. And yet it's, it's just so totally pervasive and important. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and talk about these laws and then uh, I'll subsequently talk about um, how my systems have been shaped uh, by, uh, by, these, by these laws and the phenomena that arise from them and talk about you know, sort of remaining outstanding problems that I think we have for, for building these systems. So first, I'll tell you about the ubiquity law. So the ubiquity law says that a context-aware system is useful to the degree that a person can use it everywhere and that everyone can use it. And that's sort of, ubiquitous computing takes as a given that it should be everywhere. Uh, but what I'm saying here is that a context-aware system needs to be ubiquitous. Otherwise, it doesn't really work. All right? So as an example, I'm going to talk up here now about our, our Placets application, which is uh, location-based reminders in mobile phones. Prior to this study, most of the systems that had been developed for lo location-based reminders had been local area deployments. They used 802.11b. They worked on a lab or a campus or something like that. We, we had location-based reminders in Active Campus Explorer. Nobody used it. Um, and the problem was is that these are small places. You need to be able to set your reminders anywhere and receive them anywhere. Perhaps, right? Maybe that's what was the problem was. So let me tell you a little, so, so how did Placets work? So imagine uh, I'm here at work and I realize, oh, you know, I need to call my mom when I get home. So I'm gonna, I want to set a reminder like that and so um, I, on my phone, I bring up uh, one of my favorite places, home, and I initiate a reminder on that. I say I want it to be an arrival reminder, uh, be reminded on arrival. Uh, of course, there's the text for the reminder, and there it shows up on my list of reminders. Okay? And then later on, I travel home, and at some point after getting home, I get this reminder. The phone buzzes. I pull out of my pocket. Oh, yeah, call mom. Whew. Okay, great. Right, so that's the basic scenario, you know, no big deal. Okay. Now, what we found was that, that w when you build it these, uh, and it's such an application in a ubiquitous, fully ubiquitous uh, deployment rather than a local layer deployment, you get some unique phenomena. So for example, th the system was slow to detect your location and the positioning was very coarse. Coarse positioning does not work in a laboratory setting. 
because it can't tell you whether you're in the lab or not. Right? But as you saw in that previous example, the places were things like home, grocery store, work, you know, etc. These places tend to be far apart from each other. The course system is not an issue. Uh, and it has to be coarse, as I'll discuss later, because that's the technology you're given on the phone. Okay? Another interesting thing was that uh, uh, location was used as a proxy for context, the real, the real context of import. So the real context of import in that previous example was that I knew that when I got home, I would have free time, and that would be a time I could call my mother. Detect when I have free time is like, well, maybe you could use my calendaring program, but we don't put everything in our calendars, right? And we certainly don't have any systems that can measure our brain activity in a, in a meaningful way today. But I can use my own knowledge of my own work practices to say, when I'm at home, I'm free, and I can call my mom. So location was being used as a proxy for my freeness, my availability. Okay? We had a number of interesting quotes that reinforced some of these things about say, ubiquity. Uh, someone said, uh, since I was out of town, I would think of things on the drive that I had to do when I got back, and I put reminders on the phone. So this person was in Las Vegas putting in their location-based reminders and then got them when they got back to San Diego. Uh, another person said, it was a relief knowing I would have been reminded had I forgot. This is actually one of the key properties that we seek in ubiquitous computing, or what uh, Mark Weiser called calm systems. This is an example of the system having a calming effect and that it's kind of a safety net for one's, uh, um, as one goes about their day, knowing that the system can be, you know, uh, picking up some things behind them and making their lives a little bit better. Um, and lastly, one person said, uh, there were certain activities that my calendaring application is not particularly good at reminding me about. Uh, like when I'm not near my computer. For example, grocery shopping and also when I'm leaving work. I'm on my way out, done for the day, not liable to be checking email. And what this really talks about is that, that location-based reminders are distinctive from, say, calendar-based or time-based reminders or you know, uh, desktop system-based reminders. That they're, they're unique modalities here. And we see these, you know, in, these uh, in these other aspects as well. And so, uh, again, what this reinforces is that these systems need to be everywhere available everywhere all the time for them to really function in that distinct modality. Okay? All right. So the second law is the commoditization law. And what it says is the cost pressures of ubiquity lead to commoditization, thereby increasing heterogeneity, interoperability, and fragility. Okay? So I think, I think this, we readily understand uh, uh, many aspects of, of the commoditization law because we, we experience it so directly all the time. But uh, let me talk about this in some, uh, uh, some detail. So first of all, for it to be everywhere and everyone to have it, it has to be cheap. And that means it's going to have to be commoditization, right? That, that you're going to manufacture these things in incredible quantities. And then there are going to be incredible compromises made in manufacturing it in those uh, commodities. You know, for example, think about how many dropped phone calls we experience. It's because it's cheap, right? So... Um, uh, uh, so, so let's talk about heterogeneity. When there's commoditization, there's an attempt to differentiate so that you can charge more for your product. There's incredible amounts of innovation going on. So commoditization would seem to narrow the channel and make everything the same, but that's not what happens in a free market. So every phone has a different screen, uh, a different you know, layout of keys, a different OS, and different features. Building systems for that is really hard. There are numerous network types, so, and uh, uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, um, and uh, 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 when we built places, we said, oh, we're, we're going to be running on GSM. We can just put this on any phone. It didn't work that way at all. Uh, every phone returned a different number of a different kind of cell towers and gave different information. The screen size and the butt layouts were incommensurate. It was just a huge nightmare in developing that application. So what we did is we bought a bunch of identical phones <laughs> uh, and controlled it so we could do a study. Right? But that's so we could approximate ubiquitous computing. But it was a real compromise, and that's not the way real systems will work in real ubiquitous settings. Okay? 
Interoperability. So this is sort of, I think, heterogeneity is a positive in that all these great experiments are going on, but it, it, it makes it very hard to build these systems. Interoperability is a real positive, right? Is that where there is all this, heter there all is innovation going on where there's less innovation is in the network. It has to, you have to be, anyone has to be able to call anyone, right? Uh, and that's where, um, uh, you know, that's where the interoperability uh, comes in. And so, for example, we were able to take people's chips out of their GSM phones and put them on our phones and do our experiment, and that was a real positive. Uh, and GSM tower sensing is something that would work anywhere in the world, uh, pretty much, as long as we limit it to one phone and do all that stuff, right? Um, uh, but, but this interoperability is, as I say, is moderated by heterogeneity. So, for example, uh, okay, I have, say, a G I, have a, I have a CDMA phone uh, that you know, runs, uh, runs uh, C sharp, and I have a GSM phone that runs C sharp, I can't like compare their, sig their cell tower signatures to determine proximity. They're in different networks. So that's unfortunate. Okay. So the interoperability is a very narrow interface. Lastly is fragility, which is, you know, a decided negative. And what we find is, you know, we have dropped calls, and as, as, as Unsatisfactory it is to try to complete a call. If any of you have developed for mobile phones, you know it's even harder to open a network connection and transmit bytes over a connection. Basically, if you if you can't complete uh, an, uh, an RPC under a certain number of seconds, forget it. You know you just got to start over. So, uh, and then of course uh, uh, um, uh, we also have fragility in the form of crap. What I call crappy sensors is that. The, the cameras are terrible, the mics are terrible, the, the, the cell tower signal reporting is terrible, just nothing works right. You know, it's, and, and in fact, every phone's a little bit different, even ones that are coming off the same assembly line, uh, and even if they supposedly have the same sensors in them. Uh, so that's a real problem. Uh, and the fact that there are uh, um, you know, all these other aspects, you know, an inability to port applications between phones and things like that, makes it very hard to do ubiquitous de deployments. So that's the commoditization law. So last is the systems law, which says that successfully designing a component of a context-aware system requires understanding key aspects of the whole. What this basically says is that modularity doesn't really exist on these platforms, at least today, and in fact, as, as far as I can see. Right? If you look at the previous law, the commoditization law, it says that there'll be limited types of modularity, right? either scoped within a particular phone platform or on a particular network and the interoperability to be able to complete calls between different phones. But largely, you know, modularity isn't something I can count on. So if I move an application from one phone to another, I'll have to rewrite a lot of the application, not just replace a couple of modules, right? Moreover, it, it, it's much worse than that, and that's what I really want to address here. So in this application active class that I talked about earlier, which broadened discourse, right? Uh, this is web-enabled back channel that allowed students to anonymously ask questions at any time. So, uh, uh, and just you know, quick uh, 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 review of here. Here are the questions. Again, these are anonymous. They can vote on them. They can answer them. Things like that. Okay. What the, the reason this application succeeded is we created what I call a network of complementary incentives. So let me talk. Let me go into detail on this. So students could ask questions anonymously. All right? Um, and uh, professors didn't like this. They were like, but, but what if they, you know, use hate speech? Or, you know, what if they just go off? You know, what about that? Well, so we gave the instructor the ability to ban misbehaving participants without knowing who they were. They're just like, whoever asked that question, gone. Come talk to me after class. Right? So we kind of balanced that. We had a little balancing act there. Okay? The instructor has the power to pick questions now. So this is actually a really important thing, because we've reified the question in a public space. The instructor is not looking at a hand up in the air and saying, OK, is, that a, is this going to be a good question or a bad question? Who do I pick? I have limited time. You're always picking a good question, because you can see the questions in advance. So this puts a lot of power on the instructor. The student really wants to be called on. The students really want this question answered. Well. The students have the right to vote on them and bring them to the top. It's really hard for the instructor to ignore the top question. At the very least, he has to say, or she has to say, I'm not answering the top question. Sorry. You have to acknowledge the students and respect what they had to, what, what was on their minds. Again, this balance of incentives. 
Uh, also, what we tried to do is, is, is give something for the high performing students in the class to do. Let them answer questions. Okay? Uh, and so we provided the answering feature. Originally, we didn't have that. We said we want the real discussion to be in the, the verbal, public, face to face space. It's not what the students wanted. The students wanted the ability to discuss it in the back channel. When we did that, however, we also recognized that the teaching assistants really liked this system uh, um, or would like this system if we would give them the ability to work with these answers and grade them and then also put in their own answers. They also put in their own answers. So what this means is we gave everybody in the classroom a reason to play. No one was shut out. No one was put on top. No one was superior. It's kind of balanced sort of set of incentives. What that meant was is that we couldn't look at any feature in isolation. If you change one, you could be changing everything. In fact, we only got to this set of features because like, why isn't anybody using it? Why isn't anybody using it? Why isn't it? Eventually we found out what it took. And it was like, okay, we're not changing it. It's too complicated. And so uh, the bottom line here is that, that any, a small change in the, in the deployment and the development of this application and the, and the, even the use practices of this application could imbalance the incentives and lead to the cessation of use. So I come back to one of the things we think about so much is anonymity, but without hate speech. Hmm, you know, okay, again, balance those incentives. And those things that, those are issues that cut across all types of ubiquitous computing systems. Okay, so, so what are the consequences of these laws? Some of them are already quite apparent. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll go through them here. Um, uh, and so the key point is that the commoditization is going to make failure a normal mode of operation. Things are going to be going wrong all the time. I'm not going to have cell coverage. It won't run on that phone. You know, it, there, this is going to be a really, a really difficult problem. So how can we go forward from here? So I'm going to argue that we can deal with the cheap and varying sensors on a platform by with something called fusion architectures. And I'll talk about that in, in the foregoing slides. Uh, uh, that uh, we need support for disconnect, disconnected operation. Uh, and so we need things like uh, remote objects so that uh, basically I can bring system state over, work with it even while I'm disconnected, and then sync up in the background when I finally get a connection again. Okay, and thirdly, and this may in fact be uh, the most important one, is a notion called seamfulness, first introduced, I believe, by uh, Matthew Chalmers, uh, where you have to design the application around these failures and to explicitly recognize that these failures exist. You cannot, as, system, as a systems person or as a software engineer, say, oh, abstraction. I can just abstract the failures away. So at this level of the system, the failures are gone. That's not the way it works. Failure is leaky. You cannot stop it from coming through the top. We might as well bring it through in a positive way to make it, to make it work in our favor, if at, if at all possible. And in the end, what this means is that you're involving the user directly in these failures to make them uh, uh, something that's not uh, really viewed as a failure anymore. The problem is that in doing all this stuff, you get these terrible system-wide uh, uh, interactions, application-wide interactions, that make it hard to apply these things in a successful way because it's non-modular, right? So as you're you know, probably familiar if you've developed any software, uh, it's hard to isolate failures to a module. Like I said, you can't abstract them away. In the system design, you have that, you have that problem is that the failures are all over your application. Okay, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, so that means we need a holistic design approach that you know, we're going to be doing this uh, application design involving the user, but we're also going to be doing software architecture. And there's, they're, they're actually going to be part and parcel. That is, the way I involve the user is, is going to influence the architecture. I, can't, I can't, can't say, okay, the HCI people will do this, and the software engineers will do that, and it'll all be good. And the last thing I won't have a talk about, talk about today, have a chance to talk about today, is this idea of ecological design, which is really what we did for the active class application. Again, it's sort of a systems approach to design. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to uh, highlight uh, 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 these issues and talk about how my projects have uh, engaged them. And I say, I say here we tried to solve them. I'm not saying we solved them. A lot of times we just sidestep them for the purposes of the research. Okay. So, uh, uh, so first I want to talk about uh, fusion architectures in the uh, context of PlaceLab and active campus. And 
Uh, this is sort of a, what I would say is an extension of what fusion architectures were originally designed for. They were really thought of as, as uh, functional systems and not as, uh, um, uh, that's what I call them here, innovation-aware architectures, which is basically you'd be able to substitute components to get different types of behaviors. Um, uh, so, um, so first of all, I guess I should say, you know, why software architecture? So an object-oriented system can be a jumble of objects and patterns, and I think we're all familiar with design pattern approach to developing systems. What a software architecture does is it imposes a, a global regimen on how you build a system up. You can't just plug things together any way you want. You have to follow some rules. And this is rules about how uh, components are added to a system, how you, how you compose elements together, or how you may remove them from a system. What it does is that there are certain uh, design decisions that are actually global, that you actually can see everywhere in the system. Because it's, if I says, if I can't plug it in here, I have to plug it in there, I have to do it this way, I have to do that way. Those, are, those decisions are, are visible. They're not modularized in the system. Again, it's a, these are systems effects. And ultimately, uh, software architectures are, are aspect-oriented by nature in some sense in that design information is spread across the system. But it's a system that's declared to be stable. But what an architecture becomes because of that is it becomes a language, a shorthand for discussing big issues rather than the details. And I'll show you how that works in a second. Um, in some sense, I think of architectures as, as macro scale uh, design patterns. Okay. So what is a fusion architecture? So a fusion architecture is uh, uh, conceptualized as a pipeline of processing. Uh, of, of um, where each stage is, has a unique, a unique stage of processing. And the purpose is to take very raw data and turn it into very high level information in a reliable way. Okay? So uh, uh, in the, in the uh, JDL data fusion uh, architecture, uh, the first thing that happens is you take raw sensor inputs and you map, map them to objects of interest. So for example, in this, in this first stage, you might say that Bill's phone is associated with Bill. We always have to laugh. It's like, oh, Bill is here. It's like, well, no, his phone is there, and maybe Bill is there because Bill left his phone behind, right? So that's, there's the first step. The second step is called refinement, where you're actually combining data from uh, 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 multiple sensors, perhaps, to determine uh, activity. Okay? So for example, if we get two position measurements, then we might determine a, a trajectory of motion. right? So sort of is, or integrating over time in this particular case. The third level is situation refinement. OK, there's, there's, there's a movement, but what's really going on? Now, this is where you're actually maybe determining the relationship amongst multiple objects, right, a situation. So we might determine, for example, extending this scenario, Bill is nearing Bob. And finally, we have to estimate, the system would, might estimate the significance of this. So for example, the significance might be, oh, Bill and Bob are friends. Therefore, we should send Bob a message so that they can arrange a meeting. Okay? In air traffic control, it would be, you know, please turn around or something like that. You're about to hit me. Please stop arranging your meeting. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Uh, and then finally is, is uh, process refinement, where the system actually adapts its functioning in order to work better. So for example, as we get closer and closer, we might uh, speed up the, the position detection rate. Because uh, um, you know, when we're 100 miles apart, you don't have to check our lo proximate locations very often. But when we're close, you need to check more often. Okay. So uh, as you see here, each stage is addressing a unique issue and has distinct failure modes. Right? Like Bill leaves his phone behind is very different than the failure modes here, which might involve you know, uh, uh, you know, how many GPS towers I have locked in or something like that. Um, and uh, each one admits distinct algorithmic solutions and other solutions to coping with failure. So basically, we have a, a limited modularization of failures here. Okay. So in PlaceLab, uh, we used a fusion, fusion architecture. Uh, and um, uh, what its goal was to um, basically make it really easy for people to do location-aware research by hiding from them all the details, or as many details as they wanted, of how positioning was determined or how it integrated with your platform or their platform or whatever. Basically, it was a toolkit that let you work in your area of location-based computing while letting other people's contributions 
serve as your solution to all the other areas that you weren't interested in. So HCI researchers could just take this thing off the shelf and build their cool application, whereas if you had a new networking technology, you could plug in a new low-level component and you know, do your thing. Okay. So this is a, a picture of how uh, a, a, a sort of a, a, a template of the, of the place lab architecture. So let me explain what's going on here. So at the top, we have the application. All right, and everything below that is place lab. So what we have here is, well, let me start at the bottom. Maybe that's maybe the easiest way to do it. At the bottom, you have these spotters, which are basically little sort of device drivers, which are sucking up little bits of device-specific data uh, and uh, that are considered you know, readings uh, for, that could be used for determining location. These are sent to something called a tracker. The tracker then uses the IDs coming from these things to map from uh, ID to location. And then the tracker does some cool algorithm and passes the information up. So these could be stacks. There could be multiple levels of tracking and multiple levels of mapping. And then at the top, uh, you have an adapter which translates that location information to the standard du jour. Okay? You know, whatever weird stuff is down here or weird stuff is up there, you can translate between them. All right? So this provides a very uh, uh, high level of interoperability uh, and substitutability and extensibility. So for example, at the very simplest version of this thing is just a GPS spotter, which doesn't need a mapper uh, and doesn't need a tracker. Uh, in fact, these are all uh, type compatible. And I can just pass the information straight out. The cool thing is, is that your application doesn't have to know what's underneath the hood. It's just like, oh, I'm getting my location. Cool. So same location. Uh, different scenario, I don't have a GPS unit, maybe I'm on a phone. And so I can get GSM readings, uh, and I might want to be able to um, intersect the, the, the radii of some GSM towers, intersection tracker, and then of course I have to look up the locations of those uh, GSM towers uh, to do that, that intersection tracking. But it'd be, it could be the same application. The application doesn't have to know that. It completely changed out the technology. Of course, I might uh, be on a Wi-Fi device, so I could be using uh, MAC addresses to uh, be mapped over to locations and then use a centroid, uh, center of gravity type technique. Uh, but of course, Wi-Fi is very uh, jumpy in its uh, signals, and so you might want a smoothing tracker that does some averaging over time so that I'm not hopping all over the place uh, when, in fact, I'm not really moving. Okay, And then, of course, uh, um, I might come up with a completely different approach to uh, uh, um, uh, Wi-Fi uh, location tracking, fingerprinting, something I actually uh, first explored here, I believe. Uh, and uh, of course, you're using a different, uh, uh, different mapper. It's a completely different uh, way of, of doing tracking. But then I still might want to have the smoothing tracker here. So I just all this ecology of components I can just plug together to fit whatever technologies I have and whatever my particular needs are. Okay. So this is what I mean by innovation-aware architectures. So fusion architectures aren't necessarily designed to accommodate this. What we've really done is that each one of these units right here is a mediator des observer design pattern. So this is, this is the mediator. It's mediating between the spotter and the mapper. Okay? Uh, and, uh, but it's also an, the observer of, of these things, and it's these readings that come up that drive this behavior to push the things up the stack. So it's a stack of mediator observers. Okay, and of course, this is a, an adapter design pattern up there. So I call this architecture governed design uh, patterns. Okay? All right, so in Active Campus, uh, um, we actually use diffusion architecture on the server side, not on the client side. Okay? So. Uh, so here's a, it's a very different picture. Uh, uh, bear with me. We have the uh, uh, we have um, uh, information coming in about um, uh, certain uh, certain people at certain locations uh, uh, in a in a raw form, and then again this mediator uh, observer design pattern is then mapping from raw data to um, uh, to um, normal form data. So this is basically uh, that, uh, that first stage in processing uh, that's shown in the, in, the, in the JDL where we're resolving from raw sensors to people. So basically something about my phone to something about me. Okay? And then here, this is your mapper. We're mapping from sensors to, to people, say, in this particular case. 
Uh, and then uh, once, when this information comes in, it could trigger the, uh, up, uh, a service to run, sort of a mapping service, which updates my position on a map. So this is an event-driven architecture. Um, in that uh, by storing basically into the database, it sets a trigger which does a mapping. And what we have here is abstraction moving to the right. And basically, you know, you keep going and you get, um, this is basically situation right here, um, situational uh, reasoning right here, um, like that. Okay, so you have abstraction kind of moving to the right. Again, it's not a stack of mediator observers because we're storing into a database. So they're, um, they're, they're not stacked up. They're actually decoupled from each other uh, uh, more than, say, in place lab. Okay, so this is, you know, this is sort of behavioral abstraction going to the right. Now, there's another whole aspect to the server architecture that we didn't need in place lab, which is uh, what I call uh, um, abstraction in, uh, in the system roles. So the system at one level is uh, doing entity modeling, as I sh showed here, and situation modeling, and kind of a two-layer thing. But there are actually three more layers. So at the bottom, there's a database layer. These, these, uh, these are not isolated objects. These are actually fused into a high-performance database. Up here is, the, uh, is basically a communication layer with the outside world that is managing the mapping from all the different protocols that might be used, whether it's a kind of a HTTP thing, you know, kind of browsery or a SOAP or whatever um, uh, down here. And of course, the same thing, you know, back out to here. And at the top level, top layer is what I call the sensation layer. And this is actually outside the server into the clients, which is doing all the sensing and using this communication layer to get in. So here we have two dimensions of abstraction. Behavioral abstraction in this direction, and then basically system abstractions uh, in this direction. And they're actually uh, distinct. So what this provides is a uh, kind of two-dimensional extensibility. We can raise the level of abstraction moving out to here to you know, situational uh, refinement and whatnot. And we can also uh, develop these layers, say, for example, developing new environment proxies for new networking technologies. Okay. And so what this, what this gets us in the end is the ability to plug in new technologies, new services, new types of entities, uh, et cetera. Um, in a very highly modular way. But it, again, there's a lot of design patterns here, but it's architecture governed. So there are very specific rules you have to follow in order to get the benefits of modularity. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. So to summarize, um, uh, uh, these fusion architectures deal with a number of the sensor inference issues that, uh, that come up. And um, uh, however, Place Lab and Active Campus have these additional needs to support innovation. And it's these architecture-governed uh, uh, design patterns that really give us the ability to both deal with the sensor issues and cope with all these other sort of innovation-type uh, issues. The architectures are actually remarkably similar. Active Campus is memory-oriented. Everything is driven out of triggers out of a database, so it can do all this history stuff. Place Lab, because it runs on the client, is practically memoryless. That little database, those, those, those mappers are fixed. They don't change much over time. All the sensor data that's being acquired is thrown away because the device would fill up in a couple of hours. All right. And uh, lastly, I just want to note there's a strong aspect-oriented uh, character in that uh, uh, important design information is being distributed throughout the system. It's been very carefully chosen what's localized and what's distributed. We've localized, for example, you know, things like uh, the uh, sensor acquisition and uh, services and whatnot, but we've globalized a lot of the protocols that they interoperate on. Okay, so next I want to talk about uh, remote, remote object systems as a way of uh, allowing failure to be a normal mode of operation. Uh, so by supporting disconnected operation, a very rich form of disconnected operation. So the, uh, the WIZARD system, WIZARD stands for uh, the Wireless Information System for Medical Response and Disasters. And what we're, what we're automating is the deconnect, uh, or, or uh, not automating, but accelerating, is the decontamination, triage, treatment, and transport of patients in a site-based disaster. So before people can be treated, they have to be decontaminated from whatever's uh, on, on their person so they don't harm the responders. Uh, in fact, there's even a prior stage to that where they secure the area and do a bunch of other things. But basically, we're managing that there's a very strong workflow in those four stages, basically a pipeline of information processing and patient uh, care. 
To support this, we have a mesh network that we bring to a site, and it's battery powered. Right? Here's a picture of one of our boxes, and it has a GPS unit attached to it. So the boxes actually self-locate and then support location-based services for the system as well. Providers work in teams of set about five to seven, uh, uh, basically, you know, say, treatment and a supervisor, triage and a supervisor in small uh, uh, proximate teams, and they're connecting to the, to the network. The way they share information is through a, a server, which provides a reliable backing store and consistency management. Okay, and it's clear to classic you know, database systems kind of consistency management. Uh, and that's very important because of what happens with disconnected operation. So what happens is a provider may commit some data, it would go to a server, and then that would come back to the supervisor over the network, uh, and you would see that essentially instantaneously. Except when there's a failure in the network. A device dies, a truck drives in front of it, some people wander off the, you know, away from the nearest access point, whatever. Okay, so then what do we do? Well, the first obvious thing to do is to put caches uh, on these devices so that you can cache your local state until you reconnect. And that allows a provider to continue doing their work. They can basically continue treating patients and recording what they've done. Uh, and, then when the, uh, um, uh, uh, and then when the network is restored, uh, you can actually you know, communicate that back to the supervisor. The problem is that, that this supervisor, it might be looking over this person's shoulder and say, how come I don't see these five patients? That doesn't make any sense. Shouldn't it just jump between the devices? And of course you're thinking, oh yeah, peer-to-peer. -peer. That would be the way to solve that, except moving between infrastructure mode and peer-to-peer -peer mode doesn't work very well. And peer-to-peer, -peer, in fact, doesn't work very well. Remember, all of these devices are really crappy. They're, they're, they're commodity devices, and uh, you know, infrastructure mode is really much better than peer-to-peer. In getting these things done, plus we need to you know, distribute this information over the whole site in a reliable way. So, uh, so what we do uh, to solve that problem is that we actually build a hierarchy of servers, essentially, that provide local local services, so that when my network is broken, I still I can still my information will still get to my supervisor, uh, no problem. And then when the network is restored, there's a, 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 a then system-wide consistency is, is uh, made, and that's when this information would get down to these guys, for example. Okay? So that's sort of managing the trade-offs between connectedness and disconnectedness without too many compromises. Did you, did you have to address any issues of like concurrent edits by anybody? Or yeah, so, oh, absolutely. So yeah, there's a whole uh, uh, rollback, uh, roll-forward consistency protocol, fairly classical uh, consistency management. What makes it tractable is the is the um, uh, the unlikelihood of two people in this group actually treating the same patient because you know <laughs> to treat the same patient at the same time you'd have to like be pushing each other out of the way to get to the patient. Yeah, so the, some there's some physical mediation, but as the disconnects stretch out, that actually get, becomes less true because people then start moving around. Uh, and in fact, what you have to do is if you do something, if you treat someone with something that can't be done twice, you actually have to mark their paper tag saying they got the, they got the, they got the shot for radiation because you can't get two of those, uh, you know, accidentally. Otherwise, you'll, you'll overdose. Um, and there's just no way around that. Because in fact, even, even if the system doesn't fail, you could have those types of miscommunications. You cannot, comp you cannot in the end, you know, you need some, something right there to look at. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, so third, I want to talk about seamful application design, and uh, this is like I said, this is the, probably the most uh, significant one I wanted to uh, raise. And so basically, uh, this is addressing failure mode as a uh, as a normal mode of operation through holism and application design, including involving the users. Okay, uh, very much so. So to re I'm going to revisit Wizard one more time. As I said, there are these failures that can still occur, that can still cause problems. Uh, and in fact, if a failure occurs, there's an IT team on site. If a box breaks, you should fix it. You know, if somebody wanders off site, go get them, you know, uh, whatever. So, uh, uh, so uh, aggressive caching uh, and supporting asynchrony is not good enough. So uh, we actually add information visualiz visualizations that support, um, uh, that basically provide uh, 
we provide visualizations that allow uh, a, a, uh, a commander to determine that there's a problem and to make judgments and actually call in help if necessary. So here, for example, uh, we have displays. These are basically cell, bar, uh, cell phone bar-like displays that say how unreliable this information is. Uh, and it's actually uh, context specific. So uh, if we don't have information on deceased patients, that's okay because they're not going to undecease, right? But if we don't have information on patients needing uh, regular, regular care, then that's bad. If we're and, and they, they, so their information degrades faster if there's a network disconnect. Okay, so we have a number of things. We have these basically quality indicators, of saying we have a problem. We have a, ne a connectedness. Uh, uh, button here. So what this says is that I'm not getting information on certain people, but it's not my fault. I'm connected, right? Um, so something else must be wrong in the network. Okay, you can actually drill in on this information and basically get a patient by patient summary. So basically, what do you think of it? They think of these bar charts as melting. That the less I trust them, they kind of start to they start to falter. But what you're really getting is on each patient, I have very little believability in patient 22's health. Uh, but I have, a lot of, um, I have a lot of belief in these patients down here. So some are, some are disconnected longer than others, and some aren't disconnected uh, at all. And so by pushing this information through and actually, um, uh, in this case, I should note, this is interleaved. This is embedded in the displays, right? This is what I mean by holism. You have to consider that the bar chart makes this very type of display very easy. If I chose another visualization, it might be very hard to provide these quality displays. But what this allows is the commander to actually click on this, find out which patient it is, where they were last seen, you know, whatever, and then dispatch someone to go find that patient and see if they're okay. All right, and as well as you know, try to connect the network, correct the network problems and whatever. So this is pushing the information out to the users. And again, in disasters, failure is a normal mode of operation. These, these guys are totally used to losing information and trying to fill in the blanks wherever possible or investigate and get additional information where they need it. Okay. So another application that we developed is called People Tones. And what it does is it uses uh, uh, peripheral cues to notify you that a friend, buddy, colleague, uh, family member is, is nearby. This is on mobile phones. The way it works is that it basically looks at the number of cells, uh, uh, GSM cells that you're sharing uh, to determine your proximity. Uh, and then if it gets above a certain threshold, it notifies you uh, with these uh, uh, vibrational cues, vibrotactile cues. And basically what we've done is uh, used a special DSP algorithm that we invented to encode music as vibrations. And so basically each friend has a unique signature. And, uh, uh, and of, course, of course, also could play the sound as well in certain environments. Okay. Now, there are a number of failure modes. Basically, the system is all failures uh, in some sense. Uh, that we have to cope with. So quite often you'll be in a dark zone and you won't be able to get network connectivity. Your battery power, power might run out and it better not be the application's fault. So uh, to avoid the failure of running out of power, the application has to be developed to not use power. Uh, the cell signals are being very anomalous. You can see a cell, sometimes it's 20 miles away and sometimes you can't see one that's a block away. right? Um, uh, so all of these are, are really serious problems. So, so here's what we do in this application. Uh, first of all, communications are done through a server, not peer-to-peer. -peer. So basically, you assume that your, your device is going to fall off the network every few minutes, but the server's always on the network. So even though these devices are sort of blinking in and out, the server's always there, kind of providing a stable presence for you. So your, your buddies don't see you blinking on and off because the, the server's basically bridging those presences. Right. I, you can all, if you can get network, you can connect to the server and get your buddy's thing. So even though it's like I'm on and he's off, he's on and I'm off, it still all works just fine because the server's mediating that. Okay. Um, uh, and, if, and if you walk into a basement or something or a building with lots of rebar concrete, um, it'll actually cache your information for up to two hours, assuming in a, the system basically assumes that you're in the building and, uh, uh, and then so your buddy can still determine that they're close to you um, uh, when they become proximate to you. Okay, for, uh, for, To deal with power drain, if you have a weak network connection, uh, well, there, there's sort of two things. One is you don't believe the locations that you're being reported because you're just not getting very, you're not near any cell towers, so do, you re do we really know where you are? 
Um, the other is, is that we don't try to actually commu communicate that inf bad information out. Uh, and so, in fact, because most battery power is consumed with open network connections. So why communicate bad information? So we just don't commute anything. We just cache that, that information that we had the last time we got a good reading. Uh, to deal with accuracy, uh, you saw what we were doing on the previous slide. Uh, we're not using signal strength or anything here because it's just completely unreliable. This turns out to work pretty well. And so there's even in that algorithm, it sort of assumes that you're getting crappy information. The other thing is, is that you have to get three close readings in a row. Uh, otherwise, we don't consider it to be close. So it basically slows things down a little bit, but it gets much more uh, uh, reliable readings. This is basically called a, uh, uh, it's actually barred from computer architecture for doing the way they do branch prediction. It's called a, in this case, I think it's a two-bit counter. And, uh, um, and if you've been reported close to someone in the last two hours, you don't, you don't report that again, right? Because often, you know, you'll just sort of drift away and drift back due to anomalies. Or people might just walk away and walk back, and it's like, well, maybe they, let's consider them never to have left. So it just doesn't really amplify those accuracy issues. Lastly, buddy proximity is a nice to know thing. It's not a have to know thing. Uh, so uh, missed notifications or, or missed opportunities are okay, right? We're not doing disaster response with this, right? So uh, uh, we basically chose the application to fit the technology. Right? So those are, okay. So lastly, I want to talk about reality fly through, which is a system for ubiquitous video. And I, here I, 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 I want to highlight uh, there, what's going on here is that, again, it's going to be really crappy information. And so what kind of abstractions can we develop that can tolerate uh, that crappy information so we can have a robust model for ubiquitous video? So the scenario here is that we have live remote exploration of a scene via multiple video streams. Disaster response is a classic case. Early in a response, you send the hazmat team, the hazardous materials team, to figure out what's going on. They could be wearing head-mounted cameras that's streamed out to the command center, and the medical team can plan their entry rather than waiting for hazmat to come out and do a, a verbal debriefing, slowing things down by another hour. Okay. Um, uh, we want, ideally, the experience of having be able to look at any location and any orientation. I should be able to walk anywhere and get a good view of what I want to look at. But if I only have three cameras going in because I only have three hazmat responders, that's going to be really hard to achieve. Plus, the network is going to be crappy. You're going to be dropping lots of frames. Uh, and uh, if, if I have the locations for these things, can it be good location? No. GPS is really crappy. Um, you, are, uh, you often are not going to get WAS satellites because uh, the WAS satellites are low on the horizon and they get obscured by uh, buildings. So you can count about 30 feet of accuracy. And there's you know, a bunch of other problems I really can't address. But it's just basically failure all the way down. Um, so what we're going to do, what we do is we actually show, we show the, the seams, they're literally in this case seams, uh, and let the user's visual system disambiguate and figure out what's going on. This is a, pro, uh, a process called closure as described by um, uh, uh, McLeod. Okay, so this is the system architecture for reality fly through. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, on the person, there is a, a video camera getting uh, image capture, and that's combined with sensor capture that's sent to the server. So here's a, a head-mounted camera in a, in a helmet. Uh, there's a GPS unit, uh, a WASP GPS unit on the person's body, and then a, a compass, digital compass tilt sensor uh, that's also uh, on, in, in the helmet to get the orientation and tilt and everything else. All that information is captured and sent over 802.11 or EVDO to a server, which then displays this uh, ubiquitous video, stitched immersive video, out to someone in a command center-like scenario. So, uh, so, so how does this work? Well, what we do, you can't do you know, 3D modeling in real time uh, with the uh, inaccurate information that we have. So what we do is we take the the reported location and orientation of each camera and in a 3D uh, environment basically take that virtual location and then take the camera stream being captured and then project that up in a wall in the direction of that the camera was looking. So this is basically reducing 3D down to 2D in perspective. And then if you have uh, uh, multiple cameras, 
Oops. Let's see if I can restart that. Sorry. No. There we go. So as I said, in perspective, and normally you're just looking at a single camera, but this is what the transitions look like between uh, two cameras. I'm showing stills here uh, uh, to keep it simple, but these actually work in video. So basically what we do is you uh, show them in perspective, and then when you go from looking at one video camera to looking at another, you do a, a, a rotate and crossfade. So basically you have this, this sensation of walking from one point to another, and then we uh, rotate the cameras to create that walking effect and then do a crossfade so that you have time uh, to in integrate that information. So this is what it looks like uh, in when it's actually video. So this is a single video stream. And then the person's going to say, oh, I want to go look at another video. So we stitch together. We also have grid lines where there isn't fill in. What's being filled in here is archival imagery, old video imagery with age bars on the bottom. This is actually live video, so it's all green. But so when stitching in the old, old video frames in between, you can tell that it's old and you're not, you're not misled by that. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the archival imagery gives you the chance to see everything that's in between so you can make sense of these movements in the scene. And it approximates that, that dense, immersive experience that you want to the point that you can actually say, you know, plan a medical response. Okay. All right. So, uh, so that's the, um, uh, so, so that's that's reality fly through. And here, literally, you see the seams in this particular case in order to tell people that they have to, or you know, signal the visual system that they have uh, work to do, to um, to fill in the blanks, so to speak. So to review, I've I've um, I introduced uh, three laws. This ubiquity law, that a context-aware system needs to be ubiquitous to be truly context-aware. And the crude way of thinking about it is like, well, if it's not context-aware over there, then it's not really context-aware, is it? It's just context-aware here, and that's so there's context being missed. We have the commoditization law, which uh, talks about the cost pressures of ubiquity, uh, leading to uh, a bunch of uh, systems problems. Uh, and the systems law that says that you have to think holistically about these systems. You can't think about them modularly, right? We couldn't say for ubiquitous video, for example, it's like, okay, uh, above this layer, the, the frame dropouts and, a, and sparse density of cameras are not going to be visible. That's just not, that's just not a choice. It's actually the, the failure is pushed all the way throughout to the top in a sensible way. There are abstractions, but they're ones that actually show you what the failures are, and it's still a usable system. Okay. Some of you at this point might be thinking of what's called the network law, which says that as nodes are added to a network, the value of the system grows super linearly while the cost of a new node shrinks. You know, the classic example being fax machines, right? One fax machine isn't interesting, and it was really expensive. Now fax machines come for free practically in your computers. Uh, and but every time you add one, then everyone else's fax machine goes up in value because they can now send something to you where, before they couldn't. Um, uh, and there's certainly a lot of that in play here. Uh, I think what, uh, um, and what we're seeing, though, is some additional things about, so, so for fax machines and whatever, we see you know, commoditization effects or whatever. The standard, the fax standard is a very, th very thin pipe that you put things through. And there are a lot of things you can't do that you wish you could um, with fax machines. Uh, and these systems law effects, which I think you don't see so much in those scenarios, which is that you have to, you think, have to think holistically to, to design these uh, systems. Ubiquity adds a new uh, element uh, to this. Okay. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we've, um, uh, We've, we've seen that a failure as a normal mode of operation, uh, especially in these ubiquitous systems, dominates um, architecture and application design of, uh, of these systems. And you can't simply set it aside for, OK, we'll throw an exception here, or we'll show a little green dot there, and it'll all be fine. It really pervades the, it, it pervades the structure of the application and pervades the design of the application. You simply cannot abstract the failures away. They're not going away. You have to do good things with them. Um, the, the thing to note that is that the resulting applications are, are useful, and I would even argue profoundly rich, 
uh, uh, and not confusing or hobbled, that it's really okay that these systems behave this way. Uh, and the results that we got back from uh, uh, playsets and people tones, which again, systems that are constantly failing in some sense, and yet people just have amazing experience with these things that really highlight, I think, the excitement of what ubiquitous computing can really bring us. Now, uh, that the, these, although you know, software architecture and object technologies help a lot, the um, you still have these commoditization and system specs are very, really confounding. Um, and you have to really bring everything to bear. Design patterns, AOP, I didn't talk about it, but these systems are using reflection to adapt themselves. Um, the, we're using published subscribe architectures. It just goes on and on. I mean, it's not like we have, I have one hammer and I can just keep using it over and over again. It takes a lot of creativity and energy to build these systems. Um, uh, and, uh, and you really can't think about these systems uh, uh, um, or aspects of these systems in isolation. You really have to think about the whole thing. Although what you tend to do is you build it, you say, oh, that didn't work. Let me try to you know, uh, figure out you know, what's going on. It's the only way to make this a tractable process. Um, and in the end, what's left is that the application metaphor really has to uh, embrace the failures and make them part of the application design and, uh, um, and make it part of the richness of what the application is. And as a, sort of, as a bumper sticker, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, ubiquity with failure says that it's better to operate 20% of the time in 100% of the world rather than 100% of the time in 20% of the world. Um, and with the, with the footnote here that the failures have to be bridged Right? That you have to have something that can let the human being get involved to fill in the gaps or to provide caching or whatever it is so that these failures are tolerable uh, and actual, um, uh, a part of the application and not just, you know, you know, lost connection, please try again later. So are there any questions? Yeah. Um. You, you talked about different ways of uh, coping with the commoditization law, but are, are there any external forces that might come in and fix that for you? Like the network law seems to kind of work against it, or work in your favor. Right. So, so the commoditization law isn't all bad news. In fact, I think it's mostly good news. So that the interoperability that comes out is like, okay, everyone has to be able to complete a call to everyone else. That's a good thing. It's a real positive. The pervasiveness of GSM is a good thing, right? Uh, um, uh, so that's a very positive. I think heterogeneity is a real positive, frankly. I mean, I always look forward to my, new, my next phone and my next computer, right? Because commoditization just makes it better at the same or less price than it was before. Um, uh, I think that you basically where you where you move from heterogeneity to interoperability is you know there's a standards process going on in the background i mean you know that's, some people had to agree how gsm calls are handed off to cdma calls through the through the network and um, uh, uh, the question is you know basically when is it no, when is uh, the innovation going on no longer wor uh, worthwhile enough Right? So when is it going to be to say, well, adding more pixels isn't worthwhile enough. We have standardized the, the aspect ratio and number of pixels on a phone display. Well, that may never happen. Right? Uh, you know, button layouts, that may never happen. Uh, operating systems, I don't see that happening. Um, it could. Programming languages, doubtful. Um, uh, but there may be other, you know, the other places that that where you know where we see that, you know, we uh, uh, there is a point at which where, say, you example, for example, in uh, desktop computing, where you have enough pixels. So a lot of websites are optimized for 1024 by 768, and even though I have three megapixels on my desktop, I get this web page, right? And it's just a saying that's enough. Those are enough pixels for us, and that lets us run everywhere without failure, right? Uh, and they do their, they avoid all the JavaScript that people can't agree on and all that stuff, and it works on every browser. But uh, that's basically means that innovation has gone far enough that you can use a subset of the innovation to do what you want 
We're still not seeing that. People are very uncomfortable living within the, the boxes that they're given. Just for example, uh, just even a few years ago, using web services, it, most um, RPC implementations, SOAP RPC implementations, only supported uh, integers and strings. They didn't really support arrays. They didn't support floats, whatever. It's like, I can't do computing with that. And if I took the intersection of all of those things so that I could work on any SOAP platform, I think I could do integers and strings, right? And maybe sometimes not integers. So uh, it was just really sad, right? And so we're, we're, still, we're, we're still not there. So I think that's where you might see is that, that in fact, the, the, the advancement goes so far that people can live within the standards. I mean, l uh, create their own de facto standards inside. I mean, that's what Google has done in many senses, saying, uh, we won't use these things or we have these packages for recoding them automatically you know, so that you know, people won't see the heterogeneity. But that works on the desktop. It doesn't work very well on the phones today. Yeah? Uh, a class of services could begin to dominate if they do attack each element of the problem well, then yeah. just by a sheer number and sort of build it, yes. they could become the de facto standards. In fact, that, that seems like a likely scenario. There will be higher level functionality rolled out to services that people find useful and begin to rally around. What do you think? So I think that absolutely that's going to happen. Uh, the uh, I'm not sure. Do you have particular examples of services in mind so I can? Because uh, there, there are certain services like uh, uh, Viber Tactile Response, which is done with a, a little uh, motor right now, right? Or do you mean like uh, MSN Messenger? I'm thinking of things that live in the cloud that eventually are attacking smaller and smaller functionality. That if you want to prototype something on your cell phone platform or do it, that you can actually tap into that. Yeah, so that's that's absolutely the case, and I think there, um, uh, what you run into is that that becomes uh, it's enabling, but it's also limiting. In that, right now, we don't know what the applications are going to be, or uh, what the right architectures for them are for them, or whatever. So you know, everyone hailed web services, for example, as the great savior, but there it's it's slow, it's chunky. Um, you know, most phone applications don't use web services. You know, which is you know really fundamental component, uh, and they just don't use it because they um, the networks don't stay up long enough. Too many bytes have to be transmitted, and the, byte, the the networks are too slow. So they're really enabling, but you know they uh, they limit you. The other thing is that people are going to want to integrate these things in um, in new ways. On a desktop, what you do is there's sort of what we call loose fit integration. So the great thing about Windows is that I have this dock with 80 applications in it. And I can launch anyone anytime I want, shut down anyone anytime I want. I can cut, between, cut and paste between anyone, load files. And the, none of the applications really know about each other, except, say, the Office suite, right? And, uh, but they integrate, right? Um, uh, I don't think we know what the answer is for you know, how these services are going to have to interoperate uh, with each other to provide that sort of uh, comfortable, integrated, what we feel today, you know, just you know, through cut and paste and other things, is a fairly seamless experience on, on the desktop. Um, there's not a lot of processing power in these phones, not a lot of battery power, not a lot of memory. Uh, and so to, to bring all these things in and have them communicate with each other effectively is still kind of an unsolved problem. Yeah. I was curious as you walked through um, your scenarios when you're talking about seamfulness, um, it seems a great way to think about problems. I, I, I love the fact that you're saying let's build in this notion of, of failure as a f feature, essentially, and say well, it's a known issue and let's not try to obfuscate it. Um, as you were talking about it, though, what occurred to me is you know, you, you've got these well understood situations, it seems like, with some developed technology that has failed in the field that led to iteration mm -hmm. um, that said, okay, in emergency response teams, if they lose connectivity, that's really bad, and that can lead to some fatal consequences, and so how do we deal with that? Um, how do you, do you have techniques? I mean, the, the, in other words, a good framework to think about, but um, how do you do the habits and practices, or how do you start to get 
at the root of what these user problems might be or what their uh, in concerns in, in advance, especially when you're trying to introduce a new technology in a new space, right? So the users, if they've all been doing paper-based solutions in medical, uh, you know, emergency scenarios, the first thing that they're, you know, they're, they're probably not going to be immediately thinking about in a habits and practices study, um, you know, what happens if I lose connectivity? Because they've never even had to worry about that since they've all been handing pages right. back and forth. Right, right. So, so we, you know, we anticipated that we're going to have network disconnects in advance. Why they happened, how long they were, um, and how people responded to them were things that we couldn't anticipate. I mean, we couldn't anticipate that a fire truck drives up on the scene and cuts your network in half. I mean, we should, maybe we could have anticipated that one. Um, we had anticipated people, you know, walking away from a network node or a network node failing. We also did anticipate that other law uh, other agencies, law enforcement, come in uh, and you know do 802.11b, you know, it's sort of you know megawatt energy and sort of flatten the whole area. You know, we're like, oh, geez. You know, we have this little thing called, a, I think it's called a bumble, yellow jacket. You know, we can measure these things. And we're like, whoa, look at that. You know, these guys are, and they're doing, you know, you know video from helicopters over 811 b So, you know, it's just, the, the, the world is too creative, you know, <laughs> to, for us to be able to anticipate all of things. We can sort of take a couple of steps, and then we have to build it and deploy it and, and really experience it. And it is true. We, those surprises come at the systems level and at the, the way people respond. So one thing we failed to appreciate is that in this disconnected operation scenario, we thought, oh, it's okay. They'll just sync up their data whenever they reconnect. And you know, there's no chance of you know, repeated, you know, multiple, same person being treated twice. Except that you know, two people literally standing side by side saying, how come our stuff doesn't sync up? You know, and, they're, and, they're, and they're confounded, and they think they have to put the technology away because it's not working. It's like, no, no, it's working. You know? So these expectations, very natural, that of course it, the data is just hopping between the devices. And of course that's the way it works. You know? One of the things that you said that um, in your seemfulness, maybe not to lose track of too, that popped out for me was um, in all of this habits and practices, look at looking. Um, you mentioned that there are certain things like non-repeatable medications or something where they actually have to use paper or a tag. And that's a piece of the technology or the solution. I, it just hit me as you were saying that. Like, yeah. wow, so, that, so that for, is actually something that you need to include in your scenario. For, yeah, for, yeah, you do need to include the scenario. And basically, if you look at the their, um, disaster response is, is, is highly structured uh, based on sort of a, it's kind of a pseudo-military you know, type of hierarchy of command and control. And uh, it's very well defined. It's a protocol they have to follow. When you introduce ne te new technologies, you have to change the protocols. And, but as so often with almost everything that we do, for every sort of piece of technology we have that has, you know, special fail-safes in it, for every law that we have, there's a, there's a, there's a story that goes with it about why we do it this way, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, um, so, you see, you see something bad happen, then you change the protocol so it won't happen again. And then it's in the training, basically. So we, we, we train the responders to use these applications. Uh, but then it would have to be pushed into the, if, we, if these systems are already be deployed for real, which they're not, we do these, uh, we deploy in uh, uh, these uh, biannual drills in San Diego, which are basically, um, they're supposed to sustain the preparedness of these teams for um, unforeseen events. Uh, and we embed ourselves in those and they, we, we take a subset of their people to use our stuff. Um, but if we were ever to go for real, then they'd have to evolve their, change their rules of engagement, basically, their command and control. For example, one of the things we found is, you know, there would have to be, so basically in disaster response, there's a, uh, there's a hazmat team, uh, multiple law enforcement groups, there's a, 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 a medical team, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So and uh, they all sort of come together and they've learned how to co you know, cooperate through these through these drills. You need an IT team too, basically, uh, so that people you know the, co the the medical command can call the IT command and say, you know, this half of the scene is no longer covered by wireless. You know, please fix it. And that would be a, a, become a new part of the command and control. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.